Now we want to talk about getting the job you want. Identify the segments, talk about the different portions of it. And a big thing about each section is they have different qualification levels, experience levels, education levels that they want you to have. So how do you compare? You know, you've got to look at these different areas of qualification and make determinations about what's most important to you. When I ask those seven questions that we posed in the beginning, if I don't have that information, I can't properly advise you. I'll give this elaborate plan for you to bill flight time, and I find out you don't have a degree. <laughs> I've I got to go back and say, no, 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 no. We've got to put all that aside. The most important thing, the thing that takes the longest, is getting your four-year degree. Work on that first, and then we'll do these other things. Because if you start the one that takes the longest last, it takes even longer to finish your goal. So look for where you fall below average, and then work on bringing those areas up, whether it's education, total time, multi-engine experience, pilot and command experience, turbine pilot and command experience. And what we find on these specific minimums, like turbine pilot and command, and there's just a few airlines that have those requirements. Company, the best companies, regrettably, have those requirements. That would be UPS, FedEx, um, Southwest, uh, Alaska, AirTran used to have a small number there. And what they've done is use that to screen out pilots. They had too many applicants, they raised the qualifications. The only way to get turbine PIC for most pilots is to make captain at a regional national carrier and fly there long enough to get the minimum, which is a thousand for the, for the highest qualification requiring companies. Now, do you get hired at the minimums? Probably not. They're the minimums, okay? so. You, we want you to plan. If you're making a plan and you want to work for FedEx or UPS and the minimum is 1,000 hours, then you need to get plan on 2,000 hours. So before you move away from that job where you might go fly a bigger plane as co-pilot, make sure you have twice the stated minimums of the company you want to work for. Here's the split between military and civilian. The military in green, predominant, you know, through the mid-90s. And then we begin to hire a lot of pilots. And the military is a fixed supply. The military is only so many. If you need a lot of pilots, you hire those pilots up, there are no more. So all the pilots above that level have to come from the civilian background. And that's what we had today. Very few military pilots available and a lot of civilian hiring. Ever since the mid-90s, we've had more civilian hiring than military hiring, and we expect it to stay that way. All right, looking at uh, foreign flying going forward, a lot of interest in foreign flying. You saw my forecast, foreign opportunities are abundant. However, not everybody can work over there. It, it takes a special combination of circumstances to get you into these jobs. In the past, they hired mostly captains. The few first officers they did hire were not typically upgraded to captain. If you were hired as a first officer, you stayed as a first officer. Big difference in pay and benefits, of course. So if you can qualify at the captain level and start there, that's what you want to do. Um, to get there, you have to meet the requirements of the leasing company. And they have a screening process. They take you through very much like an airline hiring process. You have to re meet the requirements of the contracting carrier. So they're going to put you through an interview as well and give you a medical, a SIM evaluation. OK, the requirements, they, well, they love high time and seat. And if they can get it, that's what they're going to hire. But they're having trouble getting it now. So they're starting to back off of this high time and seat. We've seen it come down from you know, thousands of hours to hundreds of hours. And now we're even seeing a few that will take similar experience. So they need a 777 captain, they'll hire a 67 captain because that airplane is very similar and train him to the 777. That's never happened before since I've been watching for 25, 30 years. They're starting to cross-qualify people into the seat. Um, they do like, of course, the, the biggest shortages are on the, the biggest airplanes. Um, so that time requirement's coming down. Uh, they're also starting to need pilots in smaller planes. Not just the 7.4s and 777s, but down into the 737s and Airbus A320s. And even into the regional jets. A lot of crew leasing opportunities around the world now in small jets and even in business jets. So we're seeing a lot. It even goes as low as CFIs. I mean, there are some regions that will put you into a paid flight instructor position in the middle of China for pretty good money. Corporate flying, uh, we estimate about uh, 18,000 pilots, about 14,000 aircraft, so 1.23 pilots per plane. Corporate jobs are hard to obtain. I mean, they're really good corporate jobs. They're tougher to get than these airline jobs. The airlines lay out a procedure. You know what to do. You know what the minimums are. You get the job. The corporate stuff, it's very much who you know. Um, I would always joke that the typical corporate flight department manager has a rubber band wrapped around a bunch of business cards. <laughs> and when he needs something, whether it's his car fixed or a pilot, he goes to his rubber band, looks in his business cards, and calls somebody. If that doesn't work, he has a file folder. In the file folder are a bunch of resumes. He tries that. If neither one of those work, he calls his friends and asks him about his 
rubber band around the business card and his file folder. If all else fails, then he goes outside to try to find somebody, might advertise. Very unlikely. It's a good old boy system. The network is going to get these jobs. That's how it works. And you really need to work the network. Buying beers, sending Christmas cards, and, Kate, and dating the occasional ugly sister is what it takes to get these jobs. In addition to corporate flying, there are fractional operators. Fractional is when you own a share of a business jet, like a share of a condo at the beach. Um, there's eight fractional operators. They have about 3,700 pilots, about 1,000 airplanes. Uh, four of them interviewing now, so about half. Regrettably, it's the bottom end of the market, the smaller planes and the turboprop sort that are doing the interviewing. Their previous hiring experience, they, they've hired 24% of their pilots in a single year. If they hire 24% of their pilots in a single year and half of their pilots are captains, how long does it take to make captain? Two years, okay? They were really booming, but it's also really cooled off now. They boomed after 9-11 because of security issues, but with a regular recession, when business goes down, corporate flying goes down, fractional flying is way down. They have 731 on furlough, which is 16%, mostly at NetJets and flight options. NetJets, by the way, has more than 60% of all the fractional airplanes in the world. I mean, they are the mother of all fractional operators. Fractional operators, the minimum requirements for the, the companies like NetJets, um, 1,500 to 2,500 hours of total time, but they, they prefer about 5,000. Uh, PIC time, 750 or more. Remember, the majors were 1,000 at the biggest companies and no requirements at smaller companies. Multi-engine, 500 to 1,500. Turbine time, 500 to 1,500. Others, they like an ATP, a class one medical, six month currency, and a four year degree. That sounds just like a major airline because it is just like a major airline. Outside of corporations, let's look at airline pilots and how they're distributed. First of all, like I said, most of the pilots in the country are major airline pilots, 60% of them. And another 26% are national airline pilots. That's 86% of the market. All the rest are small players. I mean, look at the fractionals, 4%. Non-jet operators, people that operate turboprops only, 2%, okay? And these other jet operators, small groups, some of them have big airplanes or a few small airplanes that don't have much revenue. The difference between a major is a billion or more annual revenue a national, 100 million to a billion, and this is less than 100 million. Starting with our smallest airline, our regional airlines, um, I say smallest airlines, they fly the smallest planes, uh, they have about 20,000 pilots and 2,000 aircraft, about 10 pilots per plane. 14 of 18 are interviewing now, they've been doing a fair amount of hiring, 598 on furlough, just at a couple of companies, Mesa, Comair, and American Eagle. Again, if you were going to get some type of qualification, get one where there's a lot of airplanes. If you go out and learn to fly a Hansa jet, there are no Hansa jets. Once you're qualified, there's nowhere to go. If you're going to go learn to get to fly something, get a qualification in an airplane where there's a lot of job opportunities. Here's their fleet again, mostly CRJs and ERJs, okay, 38 national airlines. Major airlines, this is the plum. This is what you, when you ride the merry-go-round. This is what you're trying to catch. This is the golden ring. There's 11 airlines. There will be 10 when the consolidations are complete, or maybe nine. Uh, 59,000 pilots, 4,500 aircraft, all bigger than 100 seats. Five interviewing, about half of them interviewing now. In 08, well, this is the percentage they've been hiring. It's going to run between 2.5 and 5% a year. They have 3,178 on furlough, all at American United, only 80 at UPS. They're in contract negotiations. I expect when their contract is over, they will begin to hire again in response to an improving market. These are the major fleets, the size of the fleets. These are airlines that have aircraft on order and option. So the size of the airlines, it's a lot of a big four here, Delta, United, Southwest, and American, and they all have orders and options. FedEx and UPS don't show a lot of orders and options because they don't use very many new airplanes. They typically convert older airplanes into freighters. They have started buying some new airplanes now, so we see a little bit of a forecast for them. Here's a chart I made up a while back of the percentage of international versus domestic flying. The good news is the airplanes they fly across the ocean are typically wide-body airplanes. Big airplanes, of course, to pilots mean big paychecks. What you don't see here in pilot pay is sort of a hidden piece here. You look at a W-2 and say, that's what I made. I got it. The government says it right there. That's what I made. What you don't realize when you calculate career value, which should include not only pay but benefits and retirement, 
you should look at these amounts. This is the W-2. It's only 53% of the value of an airline pilot career. So if a guy made 150, what was it worth? 300. It's worth twice what he's paid because of these excellent benefits, retirement. Now you hear that retirement's gone. And as a pilot at United that went through a bankruptcy, my retirement was seriously damaged. But that can't happen again. What is United's retirement today? If you started at United today, you would have a 16% company paid retirement. That is huge. 16% of these large numbers I'm already talking about. Growing tax-free for 25, 30, 35 years yields retirement lump sums that exceed $3 million. But retirement's dead, right? If you stop a pilot, he'll tell you. Retirement. I lost my retirement, but that doesn't mean you lose yours. They've changed the rules. Retirements have a different structure. It's your money the day it's paid, and you keep it whenever you leave or retire. So let's look at the, the green here is the W-2 wages. Okay, the blue are active benefits. The yellow are the, and purple are the retirement programs. And even though the W-2 wages are all very similar, it's really the retirement programs that distinguish the airlines. And this is money you never see. Don't talk about, most pilots don't fully understand it. So realize there's a big difference between pay and career value, big difference. Sources of pilots in the future, where will our pilots come from? Uh, military, 20%. But national airlines, jet operators, non-jets, and fractionals will provide the most. And the nationals are over half. These small airlines that you're going to go work for as your first job are going to be the basis for over half of the pilots that major airlines hire in the future. There's a, a new law coming. We've been talking about it during my presentation. It's called H.R. 5900, the Airline Safety Act. It's effective August 2nd of 2013. Requires all airline pilots, including first officers, not just captains, to have an ATP and a type rating. 1,500 hours and the new ATP training course with a minimum of 50 hours. And the new ATP training course has some stiff requirements in it. The NRPM, this is Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, which will set the rules by which the law is implemented has allowed for reduced minimums for military pilots and for certain civilian pilots that go to a four-year school and get their flight training at that school. The good news for those of us that aren't in that category are that there are very few military pilots now. Half of the Air Force pilots coming out fly drones. Um, and the four-year schools produce very few pilots and even fewer that get flight training at their own school. So the, Current pilots are not grandfathered in. That's going to make a lot of training. Each airline has some pilots that don't have ATPs even today, especially at our smaller airlines. Uh, a few uh, military pilots and four-year degree grads will have an ex exception down to age 21 and reduced minimums. It's 750 for military and 1,000 for a four-year degree. But by the time you get a four-year degree and 1,000 hours, that still takes a long time. All the new pilots will have to obtain the ATP before being hired. Airline uh, should provide the type rating. The type rating can, would be too much for the individual to bear, and you don't have the equipment anyway. The potential extra cost, however, for the extra multi-engine time and the ATP course, which requires some full-flight motion simulator, could be as high as $20,000 additional. You pay that $20,000 for 40 hours of additional multi-engine. It used to be 10, now it's 50. You uh, pay it for the new ATP certification course, which is not something you've heard of before. It's about a seven-day ground school. Uh, it takes uh, 16 hours in a flight training device, and that flight training device has to have at least eight hours in a full motion flight simulator, which would have to represent a real airliner. That's going to cost about $800 an hour. And the flight training device, the lesser version without visual and motion, the other half of it could cost $250 an hour. And that's where we come up with this 20000 figure for the extra 40 multi-engine and the ATP certification course. It's going to be expensive. That's the end of my presentation. I want to thank you for this portion. We'll take questions and answers.